It's great to be here with you though tonight and I, I love being uh, a team with this wonderful organization, the Oregon Wildlife Foundation. So thank you, Tim, for the opportunity to be here with you. And um, I'm here to talk about rivers. You know, I've, I've written a whole shelf full of books. You can see a few of them on the table over here. But I think of the whole group, the, the one I'm talking about tonight, this, this uh, little field guide to Oregon rivers, was really the most fun to do. And uh, it was just a great excuse to get out and see these remarkable places all over our state. And it, it was way more than fun. I mean, it was just a terrific eye-opener for what Oregon is all about. And in the process of doing that, I got to see not only the amazing beauty and realize the amazing excitement and adventure that are available out there, but to also understand just how important these places are to all of us. So it was a remarkable experience writing this book and having this chance to share some of what I learned with all of you. I think that many of us love rivers and we certainly all need rivers and um, you don't have to really be an expert kayaker or a f angler, a fishing aficionado to to really um, appreciate or enjoy exploring our rivers. This can be a sport and a pastime and a passion for everybody. And helping you do that is why I wrote this book. So let me show you a little bit here of what I got to see while I was working on this and uh, tell you a, a little bit about what I learned. Okay, so rivers really go to the essence of what it means to be an Oregonian. And uh, even just to be in Oregon. And in my book, I hope to, uh, to communicate with you some of the amazing things I've learned about the natural history of these places, the conservation of them, and to give you the tips you need to get out and hike and boat or fish and see these places and just learn to understand them a little bit better. From a close-up bubbly view here at the Nestaca on the north coast to the big view from 30,000 feet, there's just nothing like this suite of rivers we have here in Oregon. The Columbia is the fourth largest river in the country. When, when it comes into the United States from Canada, it's already the sixth largest river in America, even before it gets here. This massive, incredible waterway that drains all of the northern Rockies and the northwest. Big rivers down to tiny little streams here like Bear Creek, a tributary to the Alsea River. There are thousands of streams like these, each of them beautiful and amazing in their own right. Our rivers drain, uh, flow from the great scenic icons of the state here, the White River, riffling down off the glacial slopes of Mount Hood. There are three rivers that are really well known in Oregon for recreation, and for that matter, all over the country, the Rogue and the Mackenzie and the Deschutes. But beyond these, there are dozens and even hundreds of other, others that are truly amazing. Here's the Shewakan River, which very few people know about. If, if I were to give a, an award for the least known but most beautiful river in the state, this might be it. It still fills Lake Alvord, which is the only lake in the central landlocked basins of, of uh, central Oregon that has never dried up. So it still functions much like the Ice Age rivers once did filling what were then vast lakes across the uh, interior of Oregon. Here's the Oahe, that amazing desert wilderness of the southeast in its deep, deep basalt canyons. The Nihalem in the northeast, northwest is the longest river flowing entirely within the coastal mountain range. And the, south, the Coquille River on the south coast flows from the greatest basin, the biggest basin and watershed area in the coastal mountains. Here's Cal Creek, also known as the Coast Fork of the Umpqua, an amazing little stream that does a 40-mile loop away from Interstate 5 in southern Oregon through a nearly wild corridor there with just a little paved road alongside it, no development whatsoever. Paddling or being in a boat is a great way to see these rivers. Canoeing, rowing a drift boat, rowing a raft, paddling a kayak, 
all these ways of, of being on a river are just great ways of seeing and experience the, in these places. And fishing is another. Angling is one of the most popular recreational pursuits in the state. And, uh, and even more than that, drawing, drawing anglers from all over the West here for the great hatchery steelhead run on the Wilson River. And hiking is a way that, that all of us can get to see our rivers, little trails and paths and, and ways to reach the waterfront simply by walking. Here, my wife Anne in this beautiful old growth forest along the Clackamas. And of course, swimming was probably the first recreational thing we did on rivers. Here is Anne in the crystal clear waters of the Imnaha River in the far northeastern part of our state. So all these are great ways to get out and see and experience and learn about these amazing places. Let's look at a few of the whitewater streams of Oregon. People come here for the excitement and the, the view of rivers that you really don't get to see any other way except by going there in, in some, uh, some pretty exciting rapids. Here's the ultimate white water in Oregon, really the Green Wall Rapid on the Illinois River. It's a Rogue River tributary in the south. Here's the Wilson River, some of the closest white water to Portland. And the North Umpqua, which probably has more rapids per mile than any other river in the state. This is the North Fork of the Middle Fork of the Willamette, a great paddling run. This is my paddling buddy, Travis, as he's entering this really sharp drop and he's lined up just right and he's hitting the notch perfectly. I, though, had the good sense to carry my canoe around this rapid. Travis, uh, I don't know what happened as he disappeared behind that rock, but something went terribly wrong. <laughs> and here's poor Trav trying to roll up and failing. He swam out, but uh, no worse for the wear. Here, a little more typical, what we would do, gentler rapids, class, what we call class two and three rapids on, the, on Drift Creek, which is an Aussie River tributary in the coastal mountains. This is the Coos River. We don't often think of it as a, really a whitewater stream because most, almost all the watershed is owned by Weyerhaeuser. It's been heavily logged. But now with somewhat better logging practices, at least by that company, the riparian or riverfront corridor is really beginning to recover. And so it's once again becoming this beautiful riverfront whitewater stream. Here's the Klamath, which has fabulous big white water as it crashes right through the heart of the Cascade mountain range. Only three rivers completely transect the Cascade range. The Columbia, through its very wide gap in the gorge, the Klamath, and the Pitt-Sacramento combination in California. And the Klamath has by far the most gorge-like white water uh, course there through the, through the Cascades of Southern Oregon. This is the Boyle powerhouse. There's an agreement to get rid of three or four dams on the upper Klamath. If that happens, it will return much of that upper basin back to the salmon and steelhead, which were once able to swim the whole way up into Oregon from, from that river, which lies mostly in California. Here's the Clackamas, great white water, really close to Portland, our backyard, really. But there are many quiet water streams that are just as beautiful and just as amazing to experience. Here's Beaver Creek, just north of the village of Waldport on the coast. A flat stream through its estuary there near the ocean. I had to climb a Sitka spruce 50 feet up just to get this shot of it because everything was so flat down at the bottom. Here's the, uh, the middle fork of the Willamette, which riffles for 16 beautiful gentle miles down to the coast fork where the main stem of the Willamette begins just upstream of Eugene. And the Santee Am, by far the largest tributary to the Willamette. Here's where the South Santee Am and the North Santee Am join. They're in their wonderful cottonwood forest, which runs for miles along that valley stream. If any of you know the Malheur River, it's probably seeing it from Highway 20 on your way to Boise. And what you see for the most part there is a pretty much a burnt out, heavily diverted, depleted, weed infested remnant of what was once a river. But if you go upstream of that, there's a section below Warm Springs Dam that runs 
with a good flow of water all summer long, just like this fabulous canoeing water, one of few streams that runs at a healthy flow all summer in the Oregon desert. Here it is at the little town of Juntura. Below that, then, it's diverted into ranch and farmlands. But on this upper reach, it's just beautiful. Here's the Alsi River, which has 35 miles of mostly gentle flow with a few somewhat larger rapids like this one before it hits the tide line. So boating is a great way to see these rivers, and hiking is another that pretty much all of us can do. Here's Anne perched on a rock along the Deschutes River, just upstream of Bend. Bend has become an amazing river town now, with parklands and trails on both sides of the river upstream of the town with paddling and swimming and hiking and biking and all these kinds of activities alongside it. Here's the Crooked River in Smith Rock State Park, an amazing volcanic plug that the river has cut its path through, and you can climb up here to these bluffs on trails in that state park. If you go even further upriver on the Malheur River, this little-known river of the eastern Oregon, you come to an incredible ponderosa pine savanna and this section of river that's only accessible by trails there uh, through its beautiful wooded mileage. And here in the far northeast, the Wallawa River from a mountain range that's very much like the Rocky Mountains itself, coming from glaciated peaks that look like they could be the Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho or someplace, but crashing down here through a final gorge above Wallawa Lake. And the Wanaha River in the far northeastern corner of Oregon the best protected wildest river in the state, 35 miles, almost the entire reach is designated wilderness area with nothing but a trail alongside it. Right near Portland, you have this, the amazing Columbia Gorge with trails to waterfalls, you know, all through the length of the gorge, 70 major waterfalls on the Oregon side alone. This is one of them, Oneonta Creek. How many of you been up Oneonta Gorge? A number of people. This is a truly amazing place. You, you park on the old highway and you get out and you start wading up the stream here and right behind you is Interstate 84 and the railroad is right behind that and the roar of the freeway and you wade a little bit further and encounter this, this massive log jam bigger than this room. But if you're able to pick your way up those logs and across the top and down the other side, the roar of that freeway totally disappears, and you end up in this sublime world of Ontionta Gorge, here with just a few other people wading up that stream along with you to a waterfall at the head of that canyon. Truly amazing place in our own backyard here at Portland. The Sandy River is probably is, is the best river in Oregon to see a glacial stream. Here it is coming off the west slope of Mount Hood in this, uh, all through this recently glaciated terrain with a trail alongside and a side trail that goes to Ramona Falls, an amazing basalt outcrop here with water pouring over it. In the Coast Range, there are not a whole lot of trails because everything grows so much and so thick it's hard to walk along these streams. But Ann and I and a group of friends in Port Orford built a mile of trail up Panther Creek here an Elk River tributary, so that we could see this amazing tributary to that stream. It's an incredibly important, for, as salmon and steelhead habitat, we'd like to protect it better from uh, the chances of being logged in the future. If I had to pick one or two or three hikes along rivers that are absolutely the most beautiful, Sweet Creek would be one of those. This is a little stream on BLM land just to the east of Florence on the coast. Trail goes for two miles with 15 waterfalls like this one. We're really fortunate in having five long distance hiking trails in Oregon. Here the upper road for 50 miles, you can walk along this incredible stream. Here the Mackenzie, 26 miles, great hiking and mountain biking along that crystal clear ice cold water. The entire Mackenzie, uh, it's a sizable river, 500 cubic feet per second, maybe as wide as this room. The whole thing goes underground for three miles 
and he emerges in this otherworldly pool called the Tamalich Pool here and then begins to drop off again on its downhill course there with the trail alongside it. Here's the North Fork of the John Day River, which has a trail for 50 miles, excuse me, 25 miles in uh, the northeastern part of the state. My favorite is the North Umpqua, 79 miles. Um, follow along this amazing stream of the Cascades. But if you really want to experience the magic of rivers, to me there's nothing like a long river trip. How many of you have been on an overnight river trip? Quite a few. How about a trip a week long? Okay, still a lot of people. That's terrific. We're, we're really fortunate, again, in Oregon, we have 10 rivers of nearly 100 miles or more where you can travel in a canoe or a raft or a drift boat for uh, the whole time without encountering a dam, with an encountering only if maybe one or two or three big rapids. The John Day is the longest, 225 miles. You can boat, it's like the Grand Canyon of the Colorado right here in Oregon, starting on the North Fork of the John Day and um, moving on down it. The North Fork is actually twice as big as the main stem where the two join. You pass these uh, incredible ponderosa pine glades that just beg you to camp there on every bend in the river and these ridge lines where it's easy to walk up for the glow of sunrise or sunset. And then on downstream into the drier canyons as the river uh, moves further downhill and further to the west. And only one big rapid at Clarno, where most canoeists carry their boats around, but it's really no big problem but a kayak or a raft. And then into the lower canyons, where you still have these wonderful native bunch grasses growing that have survived through, the, uh, through generations of cattle grazing because there's just not that many cattle in these really remote places. The second really long river trip you can do in Oregon is the Willamette. And uh, actually the longest trip begins on the Mackenzie at the base of Lieberg Dam right here. Runs down the Mackenzie for 40 miles through wonderful small rapids like this. And uh, into the Willamette, just downstream from Eugene. This was my second campsite on my 12 day trip down the Willamette. And then 140 miles more down the Willamette. Sometimes you see a little bit of this floodplain development that should not have been built next to the river in the floodplain. But it's amazing, 95% of the time, I would guess, what you see canoeing the Willamette is this. You see cottonwood trees and willow trees. Just this wonderful riparian shoreline. It's nothing like it used to be. The, it used to be up to eight miles wide with multiple sloughs and back channels and wetlands that were phenomenally rich with wildlife, bird life, and fish. That's been reduced incrementally narrowed by, by drainage and channelization and levees for farming down to usually just a single channel. But even that single channel usually has this line of cottonwood trees. It might be only one or two trees deep at this point, but still from the water, that's what you see. This is the Huck Finn River of Oregon where you can load a canoe and fish and take a few good books to read and watch birds and resupply at little towns along the way and just enjoy floating through the heart of Oregon. Great riparian forest for birds along the way. This is the mouth of the Lucky Mute River, one of the biggest forests along the stream. And you can walk half a mile to the largest black cottonwood tree in the world here at Willamette Mission State Park, six or seven feet in diameter. Then you have to stop here. This is Willamette Falls. Many of you have probably seen it. When you see it from above on Highway 99, this is what you, you see. It's, it's, it's dammed at its top. That smooth line all around is concrete. They build a dam around the rim of the falls to shunt the water off to the sides for hydropower of those industries decades ago. And it's a very artificial sort of scene. But if you see this from the bottom, it's a totally different picture. This is actually the largest, water, largest waterfall in volume of flow in the West, second largest only to Niagara in the country. 
And if you, you can't really get to it on land because it's all private still at this point, but if you boat up to it in a canoe or even a motorboat from the mouth of the Clackamas River, you see this incredible sight of the Willamette here thundering over seven different waterfalls along that escarpment. Then you go through the, right through the heart of Portland. It's all tidal water here and down to the mouth. The, uh, happens to be one of the longest Superfund toxic waste sites in America from toxins that have settled in the sediment of the river there from industries and abuse of the past. And you can boat the whole way. It's, it's noisy. There are big waves. There are big boats. And it, it's not for everyone. But if you want the full Willamette experience, you can paddle the whole way to the Columbia. Here's the, the Umqua, which is the third great long river journey you can take in Oregon, beginning on the south Umqua, the little town of Teller. You can paddle downstream from it on mostly gentle flows. Here's one of the bigger rapids that I had to carry around on my two-week trip. And then into the main stem Umqua in 70 miles, and then down it for another 100 miles to tidewater. The Umqua is not just a great Oregon canoe trip. It's a great American canoe trip. I've, Anne and I have paddled all over the country, and this is really one of the finest canoeing rivers we have here. These guys in a drift boat fishing for bass in the summertime. Lots of little rapids like this and a few bigger ones. Most of the time, no people. This happened to be the 4th of July at one popular beach. There are few people, though, on the Umqua in the summertime because the, unlike the Rogue, which really attracts people to its wilderness, the Umqua isn't really wilderness. It's a, it's a tour of rural Oregon, so you have clear cuts like this one on sleep slopes that are way too steep to have been safely logged. Right next to it, some BLM forest that has not been cut, although there's now pressure to do that. There are little roads along the side. There are houses along the way. So it's a tour, it's not wilderness, but it's still just a great view of Oregon. Here's one of the bigger rapids at the bottom end of the river where I had to carry my canoe around Sawyer's Falls. And here I first discovered that the Umqua was the longest canoe trip you could do on the West Coast way back in 1977, which was when this picture was taken. It's dated not only by the amount of fading you can see of the colors, but also the blue bandana headband I'm wearing. On that trip, I happened to meet this guy. This was my last night on the river. I was in the tidal section on a rainy night. I was building fires for all of my meals, and he, he saw the smoke from his house and came down to see what was going on. But we immediately became friends, however. Tom Richmond is his name. And so when I redid this trip 25 years later while working on this book, I decided to look Tom up again. And here he is now with his wife. Tom spent several of the intervening years getting rid of these guys. This is an immense gravel dredge that operated for years right at the mouth of coho salmon streams on the lower Umqua, ruining spawning habitat there. Tom uh, worked for years getting them moved from the river onto land where the gravel mining should have been done in the first place. Then into the fjord-like lower Umqua here, its estuarine section, and then the jetty that runs out to the ocean. Next along river is the Rogue. Here's Anne taking a sip of water from the spring, Boundary Springs, right at the source of this river, which is where Crater Lake drains too. Then on into the Rogue Valley, which is mostly gentle flows, but a couple of big ripper rapids like Nugget Falls here near Medford and Hellgate Canyon here at a flood flow of 30,000 cubic feet per second. Really big flows there through a uh, middle canyon and on into the lower canyons of the road, which are legendary nationwide as a great, just a great wild river of the West. The, uh, ever since the uh, writings of Zane Gray, this has been a place that's, that's been popularized all over the country as a wild river of Oregon. We still have a Chinook salmon run on the Rogue and a steelhead run and a coho run. They're nothing like they used to be because of the effects of Lost Creek Dam upstream and habitat destruction. But still, fish are hanging on and we're actually restoring this run in a way that I'll talk about here in a minute. 
into Mule Creek Canyon where the whole road goes through this little slot only 20 feet wide in places. Here's Anne rowing our raft, pulling away. The current's pushing you up against those rock walls. She's pulling back away from them. And you can walk the whole way out to the mouth of the river. Here were those big waters of the Rogue mixed with, the, mixed with the giant surf of the Pacific right there at River's End. Next big river is the Deschutes, this wonderful desert stream starting in the Cascades but then running quickly into the drylands. My favorite section here through the Mutton Mountains. Only one section you have to get portaged around Shears Falls where Indians still dip net for salmon the way they've done for 10,000 years on into the lower canyons where these basalt walls rise 800 feet up from the river. Here's one of the lowest rapids, on the Gordon Ridge Rapid, and uh, on into the lower river, which is this uh, site that Tim, may have, Tim mentioned, I think, where the Oregon Wildlife Foundation was instrumental in protecting miles of river here in the lower Deschutes by buying it for preservation as open space. Just a, a great contribution that this wonderful organization has made to river protection in Oregon. There are two other long trips that very few people do, and I'll show you why. Here's one, the Sayusla, which flows in that fog, summer fog belt down there out to the ocean in the distance. And for about 90 miles or so, much of the way is through these beautiful woodlands of the coastal mountain ranges. I had read that you could do that it was relatively easy rapids, class two rapids for 80 miles on the Sayusla if you had it at just a moderate flow after the winter storms but before it dries up in the summer. So my paddling buddy Trav and I picked the first of April for a trip. We had a good weather report. We drove to the upper end of this 80 mile trip just below Sayusla Falls. We put the boats in the river anticipating a carefree four days of paddling and here's what we encountered after one bend in the river. We ran around another bend and came to another log jam and then another one and then another one. We had 18 log jams in two days on the upper Sayusla. But you know, we kind of got into it. We called it log jamming. Here's Trav. You would say, how are we going to get through this one, Trav? And so he, fit, he actually had to depress the canoe into the water a little bit to get it under this giant log. There he is hand paddling out with a smile on his face. But we got through that in two days and there weren't very many log jams after that. We had these rock dams that the Bureau of Land Management has built to enhance salmon habitat. We found slots through most of them. And then that wonderful weather report deteriorated and it snowed the last night we were there. We woke up with two inches of snow in the tents and here we are scouting the biggest rapid of the whole trip the last day from a railroad bridge in a little bl April blizzard there on the lower Sayusla. So not a whole lot of people do the long trip on the Sayusla, though we, we loved it anyway. Here's the Chetco, another really extraordinary river of the south coast. You know, most rivers start in the mountains and they flow out to the ocean or to a bigger river like the Deschutes or the Willamette. But the Chetco flows all through the Siskiyou Mountains. It flows north and then west and south and west again and finally takes a bead on the ocean. But it offers just an amazing wilderness tour of this really remote, difficult to see mountain range, the Siskiyou Mountains of the south. It flows with giant rapids, giant undercut rocks that we would never attempt to do at a big healthy flow, normal boating flow. So Ann and I go when the water's really low, we take inflatable kayaks where you can just run into rocks, you can get out and drag, you jump, we probably jumped in and out of our boats a hundred times in four days there. Here's Colleen McNally, a guide for Northwest Rafting Company who's just finessed this little rapid and is surfing below it here. And, and here's uh, another one of the problems. It's low water, so we don't have that problem of getting pinned in the undercut rocks, but you do have the problem of fitting through. So this is my buddy Zach. Is he really going to make it through there? I had just made this slot myself in my boat, but Zach's about twice my size. So how is he possibly going to make it? Can he do it? Yes, he can. He did it. <laughs> 
And here we definitely had to carry around this one. This is Radiolaria. Radiolaria is a microscopic creature that grows in the sea. And when it dies, the skeletons form rock, much as shells form limestone. And then that rock was uplifted in the coast range uplift and became the rapids of the lower Chetco River. It's that striped pink and gray and white rock, Radiolaria. And right below that cone head, another rapid that would have just been impossible to negotiate safely at a higher flow. But here at low flow, we were able to wade among these big rocks and logs and pass our boats down from one to the other. So Chetco, it's an incredible wilderness, strenuous trip. Not a whole lot of people do, but the rewards are amazing if you do. Below there, the Chetco is absolutely beautiful and a river for everybody. Here as it riffles on out of the coast range, Great for drift boating. Anglers love it for salmon and steelhead fishing in the winter and the spring. Swimmers love it in the summer because the water warms up the way rivers like the Mackenzie never do. You can snorkel for fish, just a great summer vacation spot. I haven't talked much about the problems of rivers tonight. I've spared you. I could talk about that all night long. But let me just mention a few of them here. What you see here is a landslide in the background on the South Coquille River. Above this, 200 acres had been clear cut recently. And the logging cup, private industrial forest land, they had left the required 100 foot buffer, but the clear cutting so disturbed the land above it and the hydrology and the drainage of it that when they finished, the whole 100 foot buffer simply slid into the river destroying what had been just fabulous Chinook salmon spawning beds. I called up the Department of Forestry officials after this trip just to see what was up, and they said, oh, yeah, the, the logging company there met all the requirements of the law. They were required to leave a 100-foot buffer, and they did. And it can even log large trees within that buffer. But they left the buffer. But they so disturbed that landscape that the buffer simply slid away into the river. The, uh, the question remained, are the requirements adequate to protect our rivers and our fish? And I think this clearly illustrates that they are not. Pollution and warm water is another one of the problems. You know, we got rid of most of the really egregious pollution problems in the 70s and the 80s. Tom McCall was famous for this, for cleaning up the Willamette and Governor Bob Straub. But we're left with the uh, a more ubiquitous problem of polluted runoff from big er disturbed areas of land, such as urban areas, farmed areas, clear-cut logging areas. The water warms up, the hydrology's changed, it makes it uh, much more suitable to these blue-green toxic algae to grow. This is the Klamath River, which has become a real poster child of pollution of this type. The, uh, the algae of this river pollute the stream for 100 miles downstream. The, uh, we've got to come to grips with that type of pollution as well. Then the issue of diversions. This is the Powder River in the northeast. The river's on the left. The ditch is on the right. Pretty soon all the water's in the ditch. None of it's in the river. Here's the tributary to the north fork of the John Day bone dry because of diversions from it. A group called Water Watch, Oregon Water Watch, works on trying to correct some of these problems. So we have troubles like that and many more, but fortunately in Oregon, we also have a wonderful restoration movement for rivers. And here's one of the great success stories. This is Savage Rapids Dam on the Rogue River. Since the 1920s, this blocked most of the salmon and steelhead from going above this dam upstream of Grants Pass. After 20 years of effort, we finally got rid of Savage Rapids Dam. It served no further purpose. It was built for irrigation, no longer needed for that. We finally got rid of it in 2009, and here's what you see at that very same spot today. An open, free-flowing river. The salmon and steelhead can get by. The, in 2008 and 2010, we also got rid of two other low dams on the middle road, Gold Ray and Gold Hill Dam. So that this year, for last, this past fall, for the first time in memory, the people at Ashland, Oregon, had a wonderful run of Chinook salmon coming right back to their town, up the Rogue River and up Bear Creek to its headwaters. First time in generations. 
Here, another big sign of changing times, Elk Creek Dam was under construction on a tributary to the Rogue. It was the best coho salmon spawning stream, threatened species. And uh, a group called Oregon Wild objected. The Corps continued to build. They got a third of the way done with this dam. The state came on board opposing it. They got an injunction to stop it. Eventually, the Army Corps even agreed that it was a mistake, and they notched this dam back down to river level so that the salmon could get back up Elk Creek. The last real mega dam that was attempted to be built in Oregon. A lot of dams were built, some of them really large. This is Hell's Canyon Dam. Hell's Canyon was very much like the Grand Canyon itself in terms of rapids and wilderness, 200 miles, a big wild river on the eastern border of Oregon, the border of Oregon and Idaho. The whole upper half of that was dammed by Idaho Power Company in the 60s. The lower half remained free-flowing. It was threatened by another dam that would have been 700 feet high. A courageous band of Oregonians and Idahoans banded together to stop that so that today you can boat through the lower half of Hell's Canyon and still see this incredible place just the way it always was. Big, wonderful whitewater rapids, actually the biggest whitewater that runs all summer long in the west next to the Colorado River. Here's Anne with a smile on her face rowing through some of those big waves and the Snake River there at the border of Oregon. And we love swimming in the river and at the mouths of tributaries. It was 112 degrees this day. So we jumped in the river quite a bit. We hiked up side streams like the Imnaha. We hiked up little trails to cliff tops like this to see down to the canyon below. Here's the mouth of the Salmon River on the left that comes in from Idaho, from the greatest wilderness in the West, what was once the best Chinook salmon run in the world. Unfortunately, four dams on the lower Snake River blocked those salmon so that they went from being the most plentiful runs anywhere to endangered species. A group called the Save Our Wild Salmon Coalition is working to try to remove those four lower Snake River dams. They provide only 4% of the power that's used in the Northwest, an amount that's easily replaced by alternative energy measures. So they're working on a can, it's an uphill political battle, but they're working hard to try to get rid of those dams so that the salmon can once again return to this place. On into the lower Snake there, on the border of Oregon and Idaho. So this tour of Oregon rivers really showed me not only the beauty of these places and, and gave me not only a place for adventure and excitement, but it showed me just how important all these waters are, how important these places are to all of us. Think about it. Our own bodies are nearly 70% water, and every drop of that comes from a river or from groundwater, which is intimately connected to that surface flow. So this magic that I feel for rivers and that Ann feels and Tim feels and many of you here, I'm sure, feel is really no mystery. The rivers of Oregon literally flow in our arteries and in our veins. We need them and we need them to be healthy, wonderful places. They're from rainforests and mountaintops. There's just nothing else like the suite of rivers we have in Oregon. I hope that you can share some of my enthusiasm for these great places, and especially for the stream near your home. Get to know it and take care of it. Here from Headwaters, the whole way out to the ocean is just a great way to see the magic and the wonder of our whole state. And here as Hubbard Creek, near where Ann and I live, flows into the ocean and completes the magic of that hydrologic cycle. I hope that my guidebook can help you to get to know these places a little bit better and to experience and enjoy them more. Thank you so much for joining me here tonight. Thank you, anyone, uh, thank you. <laughs> Any comments or questions any of you have? I'd love to hear what, uh, anything you have to say or ask. Yes? How'd you get hooked on rivers? When did it start? <laughs> what, was, what was the catalyst? Oh, how far back do you want me to go? How far back do you want me to go? 
You know, I can go back to being a child. I grew up in the Appalachian foothills of Pennsylvania and in the country, and we had a garden, and my grandfather and I took care of the garden. And in the dry months there, it usually rained, but we'd occasionally have droughts, we would get water out of a spring on our property and dip it in buckets and carry it to the garden and pour it on the crops. And I realized that this spring never went dry. You know, and that was just amazing to me, you know, this, uh, magical to me. And as I got a little older, I started exploring where that water went from the spring, walking downstream. Until sometime in high school, I walked the whole seven miles downstream to the mouth of that stream where it ran into the Ohio River, which was at that time the largest barge floating cesspool in America. And I got, to, I got to see what a stream should be and should not be at a really young age. So in a sense, it all started there. You know, and there's another wonderful river in Pennsylvania called the Yakagani. Has anyone ever heard of it? It's one of the most floated whitewater rivers in the country. My ancestors went there in 1737, so I still had relatives there. So I got to see that contrast also of a beautiful natural place compared to the rivers that had been pretty heavily hammered, you know, near Pittsburgh, which is near where I grew up. And then on and on it went, you know, I've, it went on forever from there. <laughs> yes, sir. Can you tell us about legal navigability and public ownership of beds and banks? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the Attorney General of the state, I address this in my book under the, the introduction, you know, tips you should know. There, there are a number of rivers that have been declared navigable in Oregon, and they're named in legislation. And there's no question about those being public property there. You can, you can be in the water up to the high water line. And you can actually, Attorney General says you can actually be on any river capable, quote, capable of floating a boat. So as long as you're in a stream of that size and not stepping out on the land on the side, you pretty much have the right to float and be there. And I've never been questioned on a river, floating on a river of any size, in Oregon or for that matter anywhere else. So you know, they're all pretty much fair game for public travel. And as far as access on land, though, that's a matter of is it private property or not. You know, and so you have to know what's public land and what isn't, and of course for camping and all that kind of thing. You need to know what's public land and what not, what is not. Although, I'll tell you, there are a lot of private land rivers in Oregon that are so remote that no one is ever going to know you're there. And the timber industry owns in vast acreage in Oregon. And, you know, I've canoed and camped on a lot of those lands, even though they, you know, they might say that they don't want you to camp there, but no one would ever know and they don't really care. It's just a question of liability. They want to say that you shouldn't be there. So even on the private lands, you know, you can often be there without having a problem. But, but I don't recommend that. You know, I recommend that people respect private property and stay, stay off of it most of the time. Other comments? Yes? So going back to that, how do you find out when you're going to do a length of 100 miles what's private land? Yeah, you have to look at a map. So I take maps with me. You know, I'll buy the national, local national forest or BLM map, and that shows the ownership pattern. And then I follow my route downstream, you know, bend for bend. I don't do use GPS or anything like that. I just, I like old school navigation techniques. I just follow the bends and I use a compass and, you know, so I know where I am and make sure that I camp on public land. Okay. What's your go-to canoe? What's your go-to canoe? I'm sorry. What kind of canoe do you like? To oh, use? oh, I have several. The um, I have I have several Mad River brand canoes. Uh, I have an ME, which is a wonderful whitewater canoe. I have a uh, a boat that's better for flat water, an Explorer, which is great for loading up a big load for a long trip on gentle water. I have a Mad River Synergy which is a blend of those two that actually moves downriver really well, but also handles white water really well. 
I have an Avon Adventure raft with a rowing frame that Ann and I take on the big white water trips where we need a lot of gear or have really big rugged water like the Hills Canyon. And uh, Ann usually kayaks and I canoe or raft. We've actually done three boat two-person trips because she likes to kayak and I like to canoe and we both like to raft. So we'll tie on one or the other hard boats every other day. <laughs> So that's our little fleet, you know, several canoes, a raft, a kayak. Mm. Yes? What, over the years, what conservation success kind of fuels you and, and keeps you excited and gives you optimism for the conditions of our rivers and on the flip side? What threats, or what threat in particular keeps you awake alive? Gosh, that's a really interesting question. You know, I take terrific amount of hope from what we have done with our rivers. It, to, to back up, it's difficult for an informed person to really be optimistic today about the world. But yet, somehow I am. You know, I think I just came out optimistic or happy or hopeful. But being engaged in river conservation, I think has really nourished me that way because we, have, we, we do have great successes. Water quality, one thing. The Willamette used to be a total mess. You know, it's largely cleaned up now. The, so as I said in the show, we've solved those egregious problems of sewage and industrial waste. We have other problems still to go. But that's a big success. The end of the big dam building era. You know, dams, some dams made sense. You know, it's not that I would be opposed to all dams that were built. But the momentum to build dams continued long after all the feasible sites had been built upon. And so in the 70s, when I first got involved in river conservation, we were fighting just dozens, even hundreds of new mega dams all over the country, groups like American Rivers that I was affiliated with. Everywhere we were dealing, there, the uh, Santee Ann was gonna be dammed, the uh, other rivers in Oregon, the, the Applegate was dammed, but that was the last big dam built in the state. You know, we, then we stopped Lost Creek Dam, the one I showed, kind of in its tracks. So turning that whole philosophy of dam building around was a tremendous accomplishment of river conservation. And uh, you know, the, the legacy of that we get to enjoy today. But it is really discouraging too because the, as our successes increased, the problems also increased. And it's very much like the graph of population growth. So, you know, our, the, the policies are better today, the laws are better, public awareness is better. All these things are better than they used to be when I started 40 years ago. But population's now double what it was then. So virtually all the demands on our river are twice what they were. And somehow we've got to come to grips with that. When you add climate change to that, we are faced with a truly daunting set of obstacles in the next 100 years. You know, the rest of our lifetimes, and the next generations that we bequeath all of this to are going to have a really difficult time dealing with the combination, this avalanche of effects that we have set ourselves up for. So that's really tough, but even there, you know, more people are aware now, more people are committed. The, uh, another group I'm involved with, River Network, which is based here in Oregon, helps grow local groups all over the country. We did a survey 10 or 15 years ago and found there were 300 groups nationwide active in river conservation. We thought that was pretty good. We did the survey then about six years ago and found there were 3,000. So there's a group now for virtually every river in Oregon. There's at least a watershed council and there's often a strong advocacy group as well. So people were really embracing this whole philosophy and spirit of river conservation and I kind of consider it the new democracy. You know, we feel that we've lost control of our government in many ways and everything is just so huge. But if you get engaged with your river, you can be, you can reinvigorate democracy at a local level by getting other people engaged in protecting your place. And I think this really stokes people's spirits and intellect and lives. And, uh, and so I take great hope from that. I'm curious, are dams still being proposed and built? In, they are somewhat, but the, uh, but you know, the really big, there are no really big dams that are serious threats now in Oregon. 
There are a couple in California that are starting to be considered again. California is in, is in the middle of an epic drought, the worst drought in history. So that fuels the interest in building dams, even if they, there's no water in the rivers and another dam is not going to help. It's only going to hurt by evaporating more water. Yet, you know, people think, no water, build a dam. So there is interest in, you know, doing and in, in building and re-establishing these proposals, kind of refueling them. But, uh, but I don't think they're going to go very far just because they're so expensive and the benefits they provide at this point are so small. So, so that's not a huge issue. I think we will see more in the future that as population continues to grow, power needs are going to grow, water supply needs are going to grow. I think we'll, we will see a reoccurrence of, of efforts to dam more rivers. Hmm. Yes, sir. When you were talking about the Great <laughs> River, and you saw the salmon river coming in, the runs of salmon. Are there fish passages now on the lower, on the dams of the lower stream? Yeah, there are, there are fish passage facil facilities on all the dams downstream, four on the Snake, four in the Columbia, below the Snake. Then there are about eight more above the Snake on the Columbia, which we're not even considering. They all have fish passage facilities. The Corps was not going to build fish passage originally in the 30s. The, uh, the biologists made them do it. They never worked very well. They still don't work very well. You know, what we have is about 2% of what there once was. So even on good years now, you know, we're talking about record runs and stuff like that, even that compared to what was there, you know, is a shadow of the richness that we once had. And the, 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 the downstream journey of the fish is even more troublesome than the upstream because these little baby fish, you know, would just drift in the current. They face upstream. And the current washes them out to sea. They can't do that. They can't do that in 900 miles of reservoir. Flat water the whole way. Eight dams, 900 miles. Can't do it. So predators get them. They die. Their, their bodies are transforming to a saltwater species. They don't get to saltwater in time. They go over the dams, the nitrogen causes problems similar to the bends, you know, so we've tried, we've tried to deal with all these problems, but not, none of it is very effective. And so ultimately, the, the only solution that most biologists endorse now is getting rid of those four dams, not the Columbia dams, those are bigger, they're actually not as troublesome. The four snake dams though, are the ones that kind of really tip the balance. We could get rid of those and really not miss them very much at all. It is great being here with you tonight. I'm honored that you chose to spend some of your time with me tonight. Please take a look at the books. The Field Guide's 25 bucks. The other books are about half price. And I'd love to talk with any of you more. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.